All right. There's 11 participants on here. So we got to talk to them, I guess. <laughs> Do we need to let them in or are they in? I don't, they, I think they're in. It's not, it's really nice to know that you're technically challenged just like me. It's wonderful that we have this opportunity to be technically challenged together. Right. I don't see anyone else though. When you hit participants. Oh, can you well, there's, there's 23 participants down there. Right. But are we not supposed to see them? There they are. I can see, I can see the attendees. They're okay. there. They're popping in. There's a Tara, Rebecca, Penny. Hi, Penny. Hi, Marianne. I'm seeing people's <laughs> names that I know. Um, Judy. Anyway, people are popping in. So okay. you can actually talk <clears throat> and start us off because now I can see that the attendees are popping in. We have okay. the recording on. So Jillian is not going to fire us. Yes. Okay. We'll give everyone a few more minutes. Um, why don't you do me a favor as you're waiting? Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of the people that names that I see are people that I've known, um, okay. cause we sent this out to my foundation as well. So I would love for you to tell them about what, what I rise above is about. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So I'll just start, um, by saying hi to everyone. I'm Kristen. For those of you who don't know, um, I am an ambassador for the I rise above of foundation. Um, Jillian, unfortunately, wasn't uh, feeling well today, so I'm taking over. So bear with us um, as we uh, work through all this technical stuff. Um, for those of you who don't know, the IRAs Above Foundation is a foundation um, that Jillian Lashota founded for young women, uh, women under 50, diagnosed with breast cancer because we have a special uh, set of needs and circumstances that she felt wasn't being met when she was looking for resources as a woman in her 30s who was diagnosed. And so um, we offer these webinars, we have training programs um, uh, and trips, adventure trips, and a really great support group um, for women uh, and some carefully curated content to help and introduce uh, some of these different um, modalities to women who are going through or have been through breast cancer. So today we're really excited uh, to have Dr. Beth Dupree with us. I first met Beth, I was doing um, a story and she was a whistleblower and was um, trying to get the word out about how some cancers were being missed in a hospital uh, on mammograms. And so she really fought for her patients and I was inspired by that and help, happy to uh, help tell the story. But as we talked, I learned more about how even as a longtime breast surgeon, uh, she found that there were other ways to treat cancers and not just by cutting out the cancer, but also by treating the mind and um, helping people who are going through cancer to learn about uh, some other ways of thinking about things. And so we're really honored to introduce her to the I Rise Above Foundation. And we're really happy to have everybody from your foundation who's on. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Dupree. I'm going to start sharing my screen and right there it is. See, between the two of us, we are almost technically capable of doing this. So I'm pretty excited about that. So there you go. Um, it's really nice to be here. I am very excited to be part of the, uh, the program with I Rise Above. To meeting Jillian and uh, Kristen has been a, a really wonderful experience so far. I re recognized after talking to Kristen and her about her journey that um, there were a lot of uh, similarities, and I, I believe that the doing the story together um, through NBC was just how we were going to be able to um, really connect and uh, create a synergy. And with, um, I'm trying to figure out how to put these on the side here so that it records really well, but I'm just going to leave this in the corner. Uh, I want to thank my son, uh, Dean, for... Um, his photography, because this, the backdrop is, uh, for my slide presentation is actually taken from my, my porch. And um, 
I'm going to just jump right in because I think we have about an hour and I want to be able to spend time to have some questions at the end. So I was writing a, a foreword to um, a friend's book when I was going to China back in 2013. And I recognized that, hold on, I'm going to move us over here. And I don't know how to get rid of this stuff at the top. How do we get rid of that stuff at the top? Anybody know? Um, if anybody knows, let me know. You can send a message in the chat how I get rid of that little bar at the top. Anyway, um, I was writing a forward for Susan Apollon's book about healing. And it was ironic that the Chinese symbol for crisis and opportunity, they're two symbols, but they both share, they both share the, the same character. So the, the word crisis and opportunity in Chinese, they, they recognized so long ago that in every crisis, there is an opportunity. And, and that's what this symbol is. This is the shared symbol. So it really hit for me, it hit home because I recognize that um, we all have crises in our lives. Um, this is a picture of my brother, Bart. My brother was 10 years older than me. And in um, 1978, he was uh, driving home from my sister's 21st birthday party and um, was tragically killed by a drunk driver. And my brother was a pilot. He was passionate about flying. Um, he lived fast um, and uh, unfortunately died way too young. And I found out about his, his death on a radio announcement, which way back then, before cell phones and everything else, I'm sure you guys have heard this, where you're driving down the road and you hear, you know, there was a traffic fatality, names are being held, pending notification of the family. And somehow when I heard that, that announcement, on the radio, I, it, it just struck me and I quickly turned the station and the song Only the Good Die Young came on by Billy Joel. And, you know, losing someone tragically changes your perspective completely. And, you know, although I only had my brother for 27 years, um, he's given me a lot of gifts about how to live um, and how to um, survive. And so that was my crisis and that was my adversity in childhood. And for everyone on this call, you know, it's breast cancer. And particularly when breast cancer strikes at a young age, you are not expecting it. You're, you're expecting old people to get cancer. You expect somebody else to get it. And suddenly you hear those words, you have breast cancer and your entire world changes in a moment because cancer changes your perspective. Everything changes. Things, you, you, you suddenly have an existential crisis because not only are you planning for your kids' birthday parties and um, your family vacations and, and your parents coming for Christmas, you're looking at, oh my God, am I even gonna be here for Christmas? And it, it affects us physically because breast cancer is the most physically um, catastrophic cancer for a woman because it's a sign of femininity. Um, and, I, I don't, and I'm not, that doesn't mean that someone that loses a uterus to endometrial cancer um, or something doesn't have that physical loss because losing your ability to bear children is, is a huge physical loss. But what I'm saying is externally, physically, breast cancer is the one cancer that women, um, it's, it's so visible. And it also affects us emotionally and spiritually. And the worst thing that cancer produces is fear. And fear um, is uh, the acronym for false evidence appearing real. Because when fear fets, sets in and you don't have knowledge to be able to get through that fear, you start creating a story in your head about all the things that are going to happen. And every body ache and every pain is suddenly, um, it's suddenly, oh my God, it's related to the cancer. And so our job in Western medicine is hopefully to get rid of the fear because the fear that paralyzes you keeps you from moving forward. So you got to have knowledge. And when you get empowered with knowledge, it helps to be able to check off the levels of fear and bring things kind of back into the moment and back into reality. And so I've had every single patient diagnosed with cancer say, am I gonna die? And the answer is, yeah, we're all gonna die. I mean, we, 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 we can't stop that. Like that is a fact of being born is that we're gonna die. But what's different is if, if each one of us knew when we were going to die, we would live those days, weeks and years very differently. And if somebody told me that tomorrow was the last day that I'm gonna live, I would have to get off this call 
get on a plane, take my husband to the East Coast, bring my kids together to spend my last 12 hours with them. But none of us know this. None of us know what the divine plan is. So there were certain people in my life that really gave me perspective because I had been dealing with grief and loss with breast cancer patients forever. When one of my best friend's daughters was killed tragically in June of 2013, who was a vital, amazing, wonderful, you know, she was a pain in the ass kid for her teachers at school. Um, she rode her horses hard and she died tragically in a car accident. And um, I can honestly say that June of 2013 is when this second shift in my life really, really began. Several months later, another dear friend lost her son tragically. Um, and it doesn't matter whether someone dies of cancer, whether someone dies of um, a car accident, whether they die of an overdose, whether they die of suicide, you know, this kind of tragic loss really puts perspective in your life. And it kind of catapulted me into a whole new level of how do we heal? So when someone says, am I gonna die? I tell them that my crystal ball's broken and it's actually right here on my desk. It now has a little ladybug on and there's a whole other story about that. But I got the crystal ball, I put it on my desk. So when patients ask me that story, I said, let me look at my crystal ball because every single day is a gift and I can't tell someone when they're gonna die. I have patients alive and well 20 years later with metastatic breast cancer. And I've gone to the funeral of patients who were diagnosed with ductal carcinoma in situ and should never have died of cancer. So we don't have all those answers in Western medicine. So what I've had to recognize is there is a gift that comes out of cancer. And if someone's newly diagnosed, you may say this, this lady has totally lost her mind because what kind of gift does cancer give us? It forces us to feng shui. It forces us to clear the clutter in our lives because when we have clutter in our lives, we're missing truly being present in the moment. And so being in the moment means, you know, showing up, active listening, sharing, experiencing. And we often live in this, what I call the cattle shoot of middle America. We are all focused on getting through, um, doing our jobs, getting to retirement. And if we forget to live, you know, how many people have you heard work their life? They work very, very hard. They save money, they retire. And then several months later, they die for whatever reason. And they went through their entire life existing and not truly living. And so this is how I cleared the clutter. Um, we were moving out of our, uh, I think this might even be before the move. I um, hired a friend, her name was Christine. So we called her Extreme Christine. She basically came through my house and you know, it's hard to get rid of stuff that we don't, you know, we can hold on to a lot of shit. And so clearing the clutter physically in your house is absolutely a great first step, but we got to clear the clutter in our lives. And so what did I learn about clearing clutter? You know, I need to get, you need to let go of individuals who don't honor you. So clearing the clutter of your personal space after cancer, if someone doesn't lift you up, like if you walk in the room and that someone doesn't lift your energy and doesn't bring you up, they may not be there for your highest and best intention. And we all have the opportunity to create balance out of chaos. Chaos is, you know, the, the controlled chaos is what most of us live in, trying to juggle a lot of things but we got to create balance and we got to remember to live in the moment. And so back when I was a general surgeon and doing all aspects of general surgery, I would be operating on someone and, you know, the emergency room calls and the, you know, they have a kid with appendicitis and my office calls that somebody's in the office with a hematoma and my OR nurses gave me such wonderful perspective and I am forever indebted to them. And I love them dearly because they used to be like, um, Beth, you need to go sit in the corner and take a time out. You need to operate on the person that you're in the OR with. You can't change anything else outside the room. And it's a, it's a very important reminder. You've got to be present in the moment and you have to be there completely for the person that you're with at that time. This is my dear friend, Chris O'Donnell, who um, was one of my great teachers about healing. Chris was a foul mouth, ball busting orthopedic surgeon. And um, at the age of 42, um, she was skiing and had really a lot of trouble navigating the um, navigating the slopes. And actually, Kristen, I think it was there was a show. I think it was on the Today Show because I watched it religiously. 
And there was a show on there about someone diagnosed with ALS and the sisters were on with this person. And it was right after Chris had told me about this foot drop and my brain kind of went right there. I'm like, please dear God, like this beautiful, young, talented orthopedic surgeon, mother of two does not deserve ALS. Not that anybody does, but unfortunately that was her diagnosis. But what Chris taught us, this was our pink pajama party. What Chris taught us was that healing doesn't necessarily mean that you're cured from what you have. It means that you do that deep inner work, that you do that deep inner healing at a soul's level. Because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed to make it to old age, but we can all be guaranteed to live our best life. And so when an adversity like cancer or a diagnosis <clears throat> comes along, you've got to get care in a timely manner. You've got to have professionals you trust. You've got to look at clinical trials. That's how we make advances in Western medicine. You got to complete your therapies. Um, and I really believe that integrative healing therapies have to become part of a care plan and, and then recognize, and this is something that, you know, I, I tried to do very clearly with my patients is bring them back to the office to be seen by me when they reach that cliff. And there is a physical cliff that comes with cancer and the cliff is typically, you know, sets in anywhere from, you know, two weeks to two months after you're done your traditional treatment, whether it's surgery, chemo, or radiation or reconstruction, um, the cliff is a big deal. And it's such a big deal that um, not only did I get an article published in Breast Cancer Wellness Magazine about it, but it was published in the Indian Journal of Surgery last year because physicians need to recognize that when the physical manifestations of treating cancer have been completed, we've only just begun our job. So. A lot of times it can be really daunting to be on that cliff. And when I made this, when I did this talk for the very first time, um, I pulled this picture off the internet and it came foggy and I kept trying to, it was fine. And I, when I pulled it in my computer, it just kept being foggy. I'm like, oh, guess what? It's supposed to be foggy because this is what it feels like when you're on that cliff. Things are not crystal clear. You don't know what the next move is. And so there's two different ways to be on the cliff. You can either hang on for dear life or you can jump off the cliff with gusto. And for too many of my patients, they were hanging on for dear life. They were not living in the moment. They were not fear free. Their cancer treatment had been done, but they weren't living their best life. And that was something that just, I, I couldn't, it was something that I just couldn't let go. And it's one of the reasons why I started the Healing Consciousness Foundation, because I wanted to help empower breast cancer survivors to become breast cancer thrivers to make them a thriver drop the breast cancer let breast cancer have been the the nidus for that spiritual awakening and i got to work with pam um she's a nurse that was on a medical mission with me to haiti and we had worked together for an entire week um, before i even knew um that pam was a breast cancer survivor and we were walking up into a into a village to take care of a woman who i think had her 19th child and we were giving her some birth control pills because I think, you know, having 19 children by the age of 32 is enough, um, or at least she wanted it to be enough. I wasn't judging it. It was her choice. Um, but Pam shared with me um, that she had gone through breast cancer. I'm like, wow. And, and she said, well, like she doesn't talk about it. She did her surgery. Um, she did her radiation and she felt like because she didn't need chemo and she didn't lose her breast that she just was going to sweep it under the rug. Well, she had this fear of heights and um, at the resort we stayed in, there was this um, platform that you could jump off into the water. And so um, this is Pam standing on the edge. And before this trip, she said she never would have done this. And, you know, somebody just happened to catch this picture. And I look at this as here's Pam standing on, on the edge of the cliff. And, you know, it seems daunting to her, like looking down and not knowing what's below. So what does she do? She jumps in, she swims, and she comes back over to this rope, which this is my son on the bottom left-hand side. We had gone to the hardware store because, because I chair quality, safety, and reliability. I was concerned about people's egress out of the water and um, hurting themselves. So that was Pam swimming. And I know it's, a, it's the physical manifestation of the cliff, but she'd been in fear for so long and she hadn't talked about her cancer. And she thought that because she didn't need chemo and because she didn't lose her breast, 
that somehow she wasn't deserving of the level of healing that someone who had gone through more than her had. And so that was a huge experience. It was a huge learning experience for me because it doesn't, you know, everybody goes on their own journey when they're going through this process. So there's a lot of choices when you're on the cliff. You can stay on the edge and you can be paralyzed with fear like that woman that was hanging onto the rock. You can free fall. And basically you stand on the edge, you allow yourself to fall off. You could land on your head. You could land on your feet. Somebody may catch you, but you just don't know. And then the other choice, which to me, you know, yes, I am a pilot and I have a pilot's license, but finding a set of wings and learning to fly, that was my best, that was my best advice is let me help you find your set of wings. And everybody's set of wings is different, but after a cancer diagnosis, find your set of wings to move into a place of healing. So, you know, you're surviving cancer when your treatment's done, when you go back to your prior life, when you follow up with your doctors, and when you continue your medications. And unfortunately, too many people that go through cancer don't really recognize how significantly that cancer diagnosis has impacted their existence and their life. And unfortunately, people around you think that your cancer healing is done when your physical scars have healed. So there's a, there's a, like a double trauma because you're feeling like you can't go back to your life that is just before because it's not there. How you react to things, um, how things went, it's never going to be the same, but it, should, it can be better. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the same. And I can't figure out how to get rid of this. Stop saying, all right. I, I, can't see what's up top. So what the top thing says is you're a thriver when your cancer treatments in the past, but you have the realization that your future is not guaranteed to anyone else. Your future is not guaranteed to any other single person, even no matter how bad your cancer is. And I had a patient, Barbara, who was diagnosed with um, inflammatory breast cancer. And um, she was, I got to admit, she was an energy vampire. And I actually, there was a thing on her chart when she came in the office that she had to be at the end of the day because she was such an energy vampire. But her energy vampireness changed when she left and went to New York, had a second opinion with another breast surgeon. And she came back. And when, next time I saw her in the office, everything had changed for her because that young, vital physician was killed walking across the street in New York by an ambulette, by a tiny little ambulance. And she said, you know, I realized that I can sit here and complain about having inflammatory breast cancer, about knowing the risk of it coming back and the potential of metastatic disease. And yes, I, I will probably die someday, but recognizing that this young doctor wasn't guaranteed tomorrow either, gave her that different perspective. So, Becoming a thriver means you're going to learn to live in the moment. You're going to learn to embrace every day. And you're going to figure out how to find peace in your heart. Because finding peace in your heart is the answer. You know, that we can live in our brains. We can live in the what ifs. We can live in the fear. But when we can make that, when we can make that journey, that, 12, that 18 inches, it's not a long 18 inches, but it's the longest 18 inches in the world, out of your head, paralyzed with fear, into your heart where you find peace, that's when healing really begins. So for me, my girlfriend, Lauren, was another great gift. Um, she was diagnosed with a very aggressive brain tumor, like a hair below a glioblastoma um, when she was 18 months pregnant. I mean, 18, sorry, when she was, uh, when she was 30, 34 weeks pregnant. God, if she was 18 months pregnant, I guess she'd be an elephant. Um, she had a seizure. Um, we, they did an MRI, her partners didn't want to see what they saw in the MRI. So, you know, as a radiologist, she looked at her own film. She's like, I have a brain tumor. Like, what are you guys talking about? Like, I don't have a stroke. I have a brain tumor. And, um, she went through, you know, she delivered Francesca. She went through surgery, chemo and radiation. Um, the first doctor we went to kind of laid the crepe and said, well, you have about an 18 month prognosis. And I said, you, I looked at her, I said, he's got about 18 se seconds to be your doctor because a guy that doesn't give you any hope does not need to be your doctor. 
I don't care what his pedigree is or what the university is. He's from. And Lauren went on to have surgery, chemo, radiation. Of course, because she's a doctor, she necrosed her bone flap, had to have surgery, put it back in. And um, Francesca is now 20, almost, I think 24, 25 years old. And Lauren is alive and well and healthy. And, you know, she, she's responsible for introducing me to Japanese energy healing called Reiki. I mean, I was this Western trained doctor. It's in the 1990s. I think that I cut things out and I cure people. And um, I didn't know what Reiki was. I, I, I had Reiki the leaves on my farm thinking, you know, like, I don't know what Reiki is, but I went and learned how to do it. I embraced it because for my girlfriend, I couldn't cure her cancer, but I could be on her healing journey. And through the Reiki that I learned with Lauren and Amy Harvey and Beth Matlack and Chris O'Donnell, you know, we were able to help Chris through her healing journey um, to help her until the point where she transitioned. So Reiki is Japanese energy healing. Um, it is one of the modalities that I use. It's just one of many tools in my spiritual healing toolbox, but it is, it is life-changing. And so when you really move into thrivership, you're creating the life you deserve to live. You know, people can tell you that, and it may change, like what you, what you want from your life may completely change when you get a diagnosis of cancer, because you may realize you're in a toxic relationship. You're in a toxic job. You are working with people who don't lift you up, but you have the ability to create the life that you deserve to live. Everybody comes out of cancer with baggage. There's no question because the baggage that you go into cancer with is exponentially um, increased in size because you had everything nicely folded up in, in you know, vacuum sealed bags and tucked into suitcases. And now it's all out over the floor because what you're able to pack away before cancer, it all comes out. So now you got to learn how to repack your pre-cancer baggage and you got to get rid of it because, you know, I've joked and said that I have some patients come into cancer with a backpack and others come in with a, you know, 14 piece set of overweight luggage. And, um, you know, we all have stuff in life. We all have things we need to heal and cancer just brings all that stuff up to the surface. So you got to prioritize. And if you can't become number one on your top 10 list, you are not going to be able to heal. We all have to put ourselves first and it's very hard. And this is a life lesson I'm learning right now. And I had to do this for myself through my own practice. If you don't make yourself the priority in your life, you really can't be present completely for those that you love. And you really can't find the level of self-love that you need to get to move forward. So there's a lot of different ways to look at this. There are people that say, well, you know, if I put myself first, aren't I like self-centered? And the answer is no. Being centered on self is about really learning that it's okay to take time to take care of you. It's okay to get up, you know, and do that 30 minutes of meditation in the morning to breathe into a place of peace and serenity. And you got to rid yourself of the energy vampires. And energy vampires are those people who, when you walk in the room, you can feel their teeth in your jugular vein. And we, we all have them. And I've had patients like that over the years. And I, you know, I still have a few that reach out to me at times. Um, and these are people that they will suck the life out of you if you let them. And so, unfortunately, Sometimes moms are energy vampires. And if your mother's an energy vampire, you got to learn how to let her in your life to a place, but not to control you and be your energy vampire. So rid yourself of energy vampires. You don't need them. Another thing that a lot of us forget to do is we've all made mistakes in life. We've all screwed up. Everybody has, we all do it. And so if we screw up, if you hold on to it, it's going to stay inside of you and it's going to fester. So what you've got to do is learn to say you're sorry and then let it go because all of us have made mistakes in life. And apologizing doesn't, um, you know, it, the other person may not accept your apology, but, but that's, that's their karma. But you've got to be able to let go of stuff in your life that you don't need to hold on to. 
And you got to learn about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a really important lesson. It's not something that you do for someone else. It's, it's what we do for ourselves to get well and move on. And one of the things that I had to do was I had to forgive David Allendale, the guy that the underage drunk driver who ran the stop sign and killed my brother. And um, it was a tough one. It was probably the tough, that's the toughest piece of forgiveness that I've ever had to do. And one of the tougher things was when I wrote the story of my, how I chose to forgive him in my second book called Shifting Gears, which, you know, it's not published yet, but I gave it to my dad to read. And, you know, my dad lost his only son who worked with him every day, who shared the passion for flying. And I wasn't sure how my, you know, at the time, 90 year old dad was going to deal with me choosing to forgive this person. But I forgave him, not because what he did wasn't wrong, because driving drunk and running a stop sign, but there by the grace of God, all of us, you know, I, I don't believe that he did it intentionally. I don't think anyone gets up in the morning and says, hey, I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna go get drunk and run a stop sign and kill a wonderful 27 year old. But he no longer lives rent free in my brain. I no longer hold on to that animosity and that, and that anger for that event. Because if I've never, if I'm not worthy of forgiveness myself, then, you know, I can't ask for forgiveness from other people if I'm not willing to give forgiveness myself. Most important lesson of the day is self-love. Self-love is not self-centered. Self-love is loving yourself exactly who you are at this moment. Um, because we all have things we can fix. We all have opportunities for improvement. But until we really begin to love ourselves, um, it is really, really hard to love someone else. And so radical self-love is probably one of the most important things you can do for yourself. And it doesn't mean that we don't all have opportunities improve, for improvement. It just means you don't beat yourself up about it. And then have gratitude. Gratitude is such a gift. It's an amazing thing. If you wake up in the morning and you write down what you're grateful for, you bring more love into your life because you are then exuding that love and that gratitude. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, meditation is such an important um, opportunity to have that gratitude and bring that love into your life. And it grows. And I believe that hugs are one of the most important things in the world because they're huge unconditional gifts of spiritual support. And I give hugs very freely to my patients and then I would receive them back. And then I'd have a whole big hug. I'd have a big hug um, bucket in my life where. I gave out hugs to my patients when they were first diagnosed and they would come back to the office and their follow-ups and, and replace that bucket. So I'd have more hugs to give to more people. And healing doesn't mean that, that the damage didn't happen. And, and I'm not talking about healing from cancer. I'm talking about healing from all the stuff in our lives that preceded the cancer, that if we allow it to fester in our, in our hearts and our minds and our brains, um, it's going to continue to crawl. Your, it's going to continue to crawl, control your life. And you know, when I talk about healing, I'm just not talking about your scars. I'm not talking about the cancer itself. I'm talking about healing all of these things in our lives that preceded the cancer, that get unearthed, that still require healing. So I give my patients a pink rose quartz heart when they're diagnosed because pink rose quartz is the stone of self-love. And I think it's just a gentle reminder to um, make that commitment to yourself every day to take care of you. So you got to become centered on self, not self-centered. Become a priority in your life. Rid yourself of the energy vampires. Apologize and then let it go. Forgive for good. Absolute radical self-love. And then live in a place of gratitude. Because gratitude brings more love into your life. So what do I do with my patients that, that don't have cancer that come in and every, anyone that has a breast biopsy is convinced it's cancer till proven otherwise. You can, you can tell me differently, but when I went through my breast biopsy um, and I found a lump in my breast and I was freaked out because my mammogram had been a couple months earlier and it was negative. And then I feel this lump and then I scanned myself before anyone was in the office, like any self-respecting surgeon. And I found that the lump was solid and it was vascular and I'm freaking out. I was like, okay, take a deep breath. You know, I kicked everybody out of my office, made my husband take him to lunch and forced my partner, Stacy and my PA, Beth Matlack to do my biopsy. And they both had tears in their eyes. I'm like, listen, bitches, get on with this. Like, I need to know what this is. So they did my biopsy. And um, it's kind of funny because my pathologist at the hospital we built told me that 
I would have an answer by the end of the afternoon because they bought this high tech technology. And I believe this was God working in the background here. And then they came back and said, well, it's, it's too hypercellular. We can't give you a definitive answer. I said, well, then get rid of the machine because if you can't tell me what my biopsy is, you're not going to be able to tell my patients. And that's not good enough. You can't make a promise you can't keep. So that was my whisper because I found out 48 hours later that I had a um, benign growth in my breast um, called pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia. It's a lot of words for a vascular, um, a uh, hypercellular lesion. It was completely benign. But I got a whisper in my life that day that definitely kicked off yet another massive change in my life. But why should we wait for screams in our lives? And cancer is a scream. It's a scream that hits you upside like a two by hits you like a two by four upside the head. It's not a whisper and a tap on the shoulder. So I met Yanni, this very handsome artist in um, Greece, when I was there on my 40th birthday trip with Brian Weiss and James Van Prague on my voyage of enlightenment. Where I actually started writing my book, on my first book, The Healing Consciousness: A Doctor's Journey to Healing. And I found this um, the sculpture first on the island of Mykonos. And I saw it and I loved it. And I said, oh my God. I said to my husband, we were walking to the beach and we found this sculpture. And I said, look at this woman's head. It's like elevated off her shoulders. And I said, that's like, I'm on the voyage of enlightenment. I said, that's where I am in my life. I'm on this journey of enlightenment. And um, you know, his answer was like, it's too big, let it go. So we went to the beach. I bought a little tiny um, statue of his instead, took it with me. And when we got back to Greece, we got back to the mainland and we were in Athens. We randomly turned down the street after a dinner and there I see the statue in the window. I go, this is a sign I'm meant to get the statue. So um, I walk in and I'm telling my friend Gretchen, who's on this journey with me, oh my God, look at this statue. Like this is about spiritual enlightenment. It's so cool. So um, I said, I want this statue. So Yanni doesn't know I'm a breast cancer surgeon, doesn't know anything about me. And he tells me that, you know, this was, that's what this was, this, this statue was created that you have, to be, you have to elevate yourself out of your physical dense body into this realm to find true healing and enlightenment. So I, of course, am now have the shit eating grin because I'm getting my way. I wanted the statue from Mykonos, but now I'm gonna get it. And above me on the shelf was this statue of these four women running. And I looked at that statue, I said, wow. I said, I, I need to have that statue. And, you know, Yanni walks over to the statue, takes the figures, take the, takes the, the, the figurines and turns them in multiple directions. And he said, I made this statue for women going through breast cancer because when they're in their treatment, they're all running forward in this path to get to this place where they're beyond their, where they're beyond their treatment. But then they have to be able to turn in the direction to find healing. And everybody's healing is found in a different direction. And so for me, that statue came home with me and it tells that story every day. And it's sitting across my, uh, right across from me. I see it every single day. And they're not, they're in that, this configuration because I leave them turned in every different direction. So I remember that. Fast forward, um, I was doing all aspects of breast cancer surgery. Um, as well as general surgery, when this beautiful soul, Dawn, came into my life. And Dawn was um, pregnant with her first child when I met her. She was 32 weeks pregnant. And um, she had a lump in her breast that she found back when she found out she was pregnant at 12 weeks. And her doctor told her it was a benign lactation adenoma. And um, unfortunately, at 32 weeks, it had grown significantly. She came to see me, I biopsied it. And Dawn became my first breast cancer patient um, who was pregnant. And hard, 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 hard diagnosis to tell a woman who's pregnant, harder diagnosis to tell a woman that um, we, we needed to mature the baby's lungs, get, get the kid out of there so we could treat her appropriately. So Amy delivered baby Kevin. And um, while she was in the hospital, we did um, her metastatic survey. And the day after her baby was born, I had to walk in and tell her that her cancer was in her lungs and liver and um, that it was stage four. Pretty shitty diagnosis. Um, this was 
just about a year later. It was in March. Um, and she had given birth to Kevin in April. And I was being honored um, by the, I don't know, some the Red Cross or something, the Clara Barton Award. And um, Dawn came to this luncheon and Amy and I like cherished this picture because a week after this picture, Dawn ended up in the hospital and um, she died a week before her baby, Kevin's first birthday. And the gift that Dawn gave to me was she came to me very, very clearly in a dream that um, I had not failed her because she wasn't cured of her cancer. I had actually healed her because I walked the journey with her and helped her to find healing. And she is, she was the major inspiration for me leaving general surgery and limiting my practice to the diseases of the breast. So the answer is see the wellness in yourself. We all, we all have opportunities for improvement in our life, but let a cancer diagnosis be that catalyst to see the wellness in your life. Focus on what's perfect about you as you work on and treat what's not and be empowered to really live an authentic life. Find your passion. Um, keep open lines of communication with your physicians, incorporate complementary therapies. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I started my foundation, what I did, because insurance doesn't cover it, but they matter so much. Be grateful for the abundance that you have in your life and never take your health for granted ever. Not even after the diagnosis, don't take your health for granted because other things can creep up and become a leader for other people. Help guide other people along this journey. And that's what we're trying to do. And although we may be powerless to care every patient, you know, I really think that Healthcare professionals need to learn, you know, to help patients release fear and find and find true healing. And so I do believe that crisis is an opportunity and they do share a symbol for a reason. There is a reason why this, this, you know, these Chinese symbols came into my life because every crisis in our life is an opportunity to grow. When, when my hospital closed in Ben Salem that I had opened and thought it was the right thing to do, and it was one of the lowest, most horrible days of, of my professional career. It was an opportunity for me to rethink it, redo it, and really, really, really focus on the healing. So Thrivers, you get perspective. The day you're diagnosed, you, you have a whole different perspective on life because nothing is ever the same. You understand what priorities are. When you're in treatment, the priorities are your treatment. They are getting stuff done in the right time, following through, but also our priorities in life change because your kid's clothing on the floor is not nearly as important as you having that time sitting at the breakfast table with them before they leave for school. If you don't know what your passion is, find your passion. If your passion doesn't coincide with your day job, find ways to bring that passion forward. My passion has always been for healing. Um, and you would think that as a surgeon, healing is part of everything we do, but unfortunately, Western medicine doesn't teach us about healing. It teaches us about treating disease. So I had to make my passion and purpose to come together, which is why I started the foundation. And it's why I've um, moved out of my surgical practice right now, because I believe that my greater calling in life is to really push for healing, psychosocial, emotionally, um, at that deep soul level. And it's why I'm doing the things that I'm doing now. And perseverance is, is so important no matter what you do. And, you know, I had to persevere through some really, really tough times in, in my last surgical practice, but I've grown in, in leaps and bounds um, as a spiritual being, as a human being. Um, and I've learned a lot about myself and I've learned a lot about how I can help other healthcare professionals heal. And that's where you find peace in your heart. So this is the new way to be on the cliff, to be in a place where you're sitting and you're overlooking the future that's in front of you. And I found my place in Sedona, which is why I live here. I found it a long time ago. It just took me a little while to get here, but I knew it was going to happen. And I also figured out how to find balance in my life. I had to create it. It's not in my cupboard. You know, I have to get up early so I can do my meditation. I have to fit in time to go into the gym to exercise so that my, my body feels fit. And I need to make choices about what I eat and what I choose not to eat and what I drink and what I choose not to drink. And here's the real honest to God's truth. 
there's this beautiful road ahead of us. And our journey in life is what brings us happiness. And it's not about the number of breaths we take in our life. It's about creating moments in our life that take our breath away. And we do that with our loved ones. So I'm hoping to inspire you to, you don't have to follow somebody else's path. Go instead and leave a trail. Let others follow you. And then and only then will you really be able to find peace in your heart. And that's what healing is really about. It's finding peace in your heart. And I found the peace in my heart um, on the top of my cliff in Sedona. And uh, Kristen and uh, Jillian are actually going to be here. And I'm going to get their picture sitting on the same cliff in a couple weeks. Um, I've only just begun this journey. And I'm very happy to have any of you follow me. You can message me through social media. Um, you'll hear more about the Healing Consciousness Foundation because I know that we've only just begun to to do this work um, with the, um, let's go into the gallery with the I Rise Above Foundation. So let's do this. I wanna to try to bring everybody in here, Kristen, so we can open it up for questions. Kristen, are you there? I, I am here. It's not letting me start my video. It says oh. the host has stopped it. Oh, hold on. Um, I'm making you the host. Do you know how to do it now? Um, okay. Now I am the host. <laughs> yep. And, and you have to go up okay. in the corner to be able to, to do the gallery view. Let's see. Um, it's currently on hide self participants. We want, we want everybody to be able to be seen if people want to ask questions. Do you know how to do that? Can you do that from yours? I'm looking. Um, anyone can type a question. In the meantime, um, view, show, manage participants. Is everyone okay with that, attendees? Yeah, because they can they can turn their video off if they want. Yeah, it's not letting me. Here, I'll show you my beautiful view out here. See. <laughs> um, I think because it's a webinar, maybe we can. All right. Okay. Yeah, what I know. I apologize, everyone. I'm not the most technically savvy. Um. So type a question. I um, thank you, Beth. That was really great and inspiring. Um, I'll start us off with a question. Um, I love how you talk about the cliff. I think that was the hardest part of my journey so far for me was, you know, when I was in treatment, I knew exactly what I had to do, what I had to get through. I had the eye on the prize at the end of it. Um, when I was cancer free, um, I just had no idea what to do. So thank you for acknowledging that there is this sort of end to it. And it's not, we're not always told how to handle that, what comes next, what we should do. So I love that you started with a little bit of a prescription um, to put it in medical terms of, of what people can do. Um, I think it's hard for many of us to talk to our oncologists, our surgeons, about some of these alternative modalities. Um, I'm sure you've come across it in the medical field. H how would you suggest or what advice would you give to people? Well, first things first, um, when you're going through cancer, there's a, there's a level of safety when you're getting chemo, surgery, radiation. You, you feel like, um, okay, they're doing something physically to you. So there's that sense of, that sense of security. And that's why the cliff is such a daunting place to be because now you're kind of left out there on your own, okay? And to make matters worse, a lot of people around you will be like, oh, well, the cancer's behind you, so we're just gonna move on. But you can't just move on and you can't go back to what you had before. So talking to your doctors, first of all, you know, there's, there are a lot of charlatans out there that will tell you, you know, take this, do that, do this light treatment, do this, body, whatever, you know, these are not things that are in that, that are to be utilized in deference to Western medicine, you know, the body work, the energy work, the meditation, the guided imagery, the yoga, the Tai Chi, all of this stuff. This is huge because what we're doing is we're actually giving you a chance energetically to have opportunities to, to kind of go within yourself and find that deep inner healing, which we all have. And as long as something isn't going to 
counteract or interfere with your Western medical treatment, your doctors are going to very typically be open to it. The problem is a lot of these services aren't available um, commercially. You know, they're, they're not available free of charge. And that's why, you know, foundations like, you know, like I Rise Above and, and the healing consciousness are so important because what we're trying to do is give people access to those healing modalities, giving them access to healthy cooking classes. Um, we have a, um, Judy Viakov is doing a, um, I think you might've registered for it. She's doing a, um, a series coming up on, you know, like facing this fear, facing this diagnosis, facing like, how do you, how do you go forward um, when you're in a place of uncertainty? And, you know, it's really the fear. It's, it's about addressing the fear and finding a way to let the fear drop because fear keeps you in fight or flight. And I, I, I think you know this, but I don't know if you know completely, but almost every single thing that I'm working in, right? I mean, I'm working in three different startup companies right now. One, we have a technology that stimulates the vagus nerve to help bring people out of fight or flight. Um, we have a transcranial technology to help with anxiety, depression, insomnia, because so many women end up on medications for anxiety, depression, insomnia, the minute they get a diagnosis. And to me, you're allowed to have those feelings and to have modalities that, that help to counteract those feelings back to creating homeostasis, as opposed to putting you on Zoloft or Xanax or Ambien for the rest of your life, because those drugs are not without side effects. You know, additionally, I'm working with a, um, a meditation, you know, ex, he's a guru, uh, Ishan Shivanand. I'm, I've, I've, Ishan has done research on breath work and being able to stimulate the vagus nerve through breath work to be able to help you in, to get into that meditative space. And that is a clinical trial that, um, you know, I will give you the information as soon as we get it going, because we want to do it with breast cancer survivors, as well as um, veterans, because we're trying to address these unmet needs. And when you can do it with that daily breath work, you can do it wherever you are. Almost everybody has a phone, you can do it on an app. Um, and then my, you know, the big, the big one is, is a uh, psychedelic therapy. I mean, working to um, bring psilocybin and other psychedelic therapies into the mainstream for cancer patients, because we know that that existential crisis that, oh my God, I'm going to die. How much time do I have? What am I going to do? Um, we know in early clinical trials that in, in patients with stage three and four breast cancer, they were, or cancer, they were able to have such sustained results from a single dose of psilocybin, you know, psilocybin is a magic mushroom. And so you know, um, and then the third one is, is, you know, pain patch signal and Jovi pain patch to alleviate pain without narcotics, because some of my patients have chronic pain. They have it from, they have neuropathy, they have, you know, um, chest wall pain after radiation therapy and being on long-term pain medication in and of itself is not a good thing. So, you know, where, where I am right now in my career is, although I have shifted out of, cause surgery doesn't fix all those other problems and all of those other problems got even more escalated during COVID. So that's why my practice has shifted to where it is now because it's all about healing. How do we heal? And everybody needs something different. And so, you know, stay tuned because this is the future. And I know um, Jillian wants to do some more webinars in the future. And we're going to kind of take a deep dive into each one of these areas because, you know, I believe that we are just on the cusp of creating that shift. And I know that it's one of my, you know, one of the things I'm being called to do is to be that bridge, because if I didn't have the credibility in Western medicine that I have, I wouldn't be able to be that bridge to a different level of healing. Right. And I think we're looking into, yeah, exploring um, the psilocybin more and, and some of the other things. Um, please, everyone, we have a few more minutes. If you do have any questions? Um, we got a comment from Judy, who you mentioned, and and she's very sweet, just sharing her experience with you. I went from being her patient to a practitioner with the healing consciousness. My breast cancer journey saved my life because Dr. Dupree encouraged me to heal my soul. Um, and so that's yeah, that's very sweet. And I think what a lot of people um, here are probably looking for. Um, I know it's different for everybody. But for somebody who's just learning about some of this, is there like a simple breathing technique that you would recommend trying first to, to calm those things? What would you? So um, that is a 
perfect question. And um, if you go onto my website um, at you know drbethdupree.com, at the very top is a meditation you can download. It's 19 minutes long. And um, my sister Sue, it's my sister Sue's meditation. She, it's called a yoga nidra. And a yoga nidra is not, you're not sitting um, doing postures and mudras or anything. Um, basically the yoga nidra to me, I, 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 I utilize it. And it was, it was a, such a great gift for me because I have monkey mind. So it's always going. Mm -hmm. And in the yoga nidra, um, in her Australian accent, which she was born in the same city I was, um, in her beautiful Australian accent, she will take you through 17 minutes of just the most amazing relaxation. So it's kind of like an introduction to, um, to how to get out of your head and into your heart, because it is a guided, um, very ancient practice that you cannot be in two places at once. So as she guides you around your body, which is why I think it's a great technique, particularly for um, you know anyone with a, a chatter in their brain, um, I get lost in it. So now when I do the yoga nidra, like I'm five minutes in and I am completely lost in it. Like I go that deep. And I used to use that in my um, personal practice. Like I would close my door in the office at lunch and like do not disturb and I'd lay on my floor and I'd put in my ear pods and I would do my the yoga nidra. And that's why I put it up on my website and it's free. You can just download it. And um, it's just a, it's just a beautiful, and it, you know, it's a beautiful meditation. Um, I use it a lot of times on airplanes. Like when I get on the airplane, and I'm doing a red eye. I get on it because it relaxes me so much. I know I'm going to be able to sleep. All right. We got another comment from your your Aww. passing here, Michelle Brown and Diane saying a big hello from Aww. Bucks County. Very thankful for the Lord for leading us to you. We're strong, thriving breast cancer survivors because of you and your foundation. The modalities that the HCF provided us has helped us live our best lives. Thank you. And God bless you. That's um and and I got it, and I have to say, you know, Michelle and Diane are leaders in helping others heal. So when I say lead by example. They have taken their cancer journey. Um, Diane's sister came to me first, and unfortunately, she's an identical twin, died from breast cancer. But Diane, Diane took that she took that as her opportunity to live her best life. And I mean, she teaches our exercise classes; they're online. I, I welcome anyone on this um, through I Thrive, uh, I Rise Above, to um, come to the Healing Consciousness Foundation website. Join Judy's class; it's free. Um, you can go on to the exercise classes. You can do the yoga classes. Um, one of the things that I love so much about you and Jillian is, you know, our young survivors um, in the Healing Consciousness Foundation, you know, they're always, we, we need to do more because when you're young at a diagnosis, it's, it's multiple hits. It's not just like the 78 year old lady um, who clearly has to go through her healing journey. But when you're young and you've got kids and, and you're trying to juggle your job and your kids and everything else, it's, it's the women like Michelle and Diane and Judy um, and Stacy who reach out to other thrivers, um, other survivors and help them on their journey to thriving. And I, I really look forward to um, a great relationship with um, I Rise Above because I think we have so many synergistic things to offer. I think we're gonna be able to um, really, you know, kind of raise this whole process and, um, give access to the women in your group and give our group access to everything that you're doing. Because I think there was, a, you know, there was a bigger reason than this show, than us doing this, um, the MAMO mishaps on, on NBC. I believe that we were meant to meet because we've got more work to do together. So. Well, and support, I think in this journey um, means so much. Uh, and I've just found the most amazing community of um breast cancer thrivers and providers. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. And we look forward to um, learning more about what you're doing. And a few more thank yous for you in the chats and the questions. And um, so I think we'll end it there for today, but more to come. Thank you. And this will be available online, right? Yes, we will okay, post cool. this. Awesome. I think you've got the recording done Please, so oh no you you have it you you got to stop the recording i have it now okay yep <laughs> stop okay i know maybe next time you and i'll do a pre uh, a pre